Hey everybody! I'm Foley here for the Weekly News Recap, the 15th to the 21st of May, 2023. I need to... I need to update those banners. Anyway, I should turn my light on as well while I'm at it. Did that help at all? Not really. Hang on. Can you tell, can you tell I've only just woken up? Right, anyway. Um... Right, weekly news recap, let's get into it. Hey Melwen, how's it going? Happy Sunday. So, uh, as part of International Accessibility Day uh, this week, uh, Sony revealed some more information about uh, Project Leonardo, uh, which is their accessibility controller. Uh, it has now been renamed to the Access Controller for the PlayStation 5 console. So, this was shown off during CES earlier this year at the Consumer Consumer Entertainment Software Showcase. No, Consumer Entertainment Showcase, I think is what it is. Anyway, um, so this is this modular uh, controller for um, uh, people who need some accessibility um, access. Jesus, this is why I need to wake up earlier. Anyway, uh, so some information about what will be included in the pack and so on. So the access controller for PlayStation 5 is an all new, highly customizable accessibility controller kit. Uh, comes with a bunch of analog sticks, uh, button caps in different shapes and sizes, a pillow button cap, flat button caps, wide flat button caps, overhang button caps, curve button caps, and so on. Lots of different types of buttons. I don't know what any of those are. I think overhangs are these ones, and then the curved. I don't know what a pillow one is. It's just a really big one, I guess? Or the really wide one? No, that's the, obviously the wide one. Anyway. Comes with those, and then there's a bunch of like additional, like markers, so you can say what each button is, and that kind of deal. Uh, you can use it on a flat surface, or you can mount it to um, one of these things, uh, and then different positioning. Uh, there's also some options for if you have additional um, buttons and accessories and what have you for accessibility. They can also still be attached. Um, you can play with the DualShock controller as well, so it can be just its own thing. Uh, maybe you just have one giant button on one side, <laughs> and then you have the DualShock on the other side. I'd be curious... Um, I'd be curious what happens if you're like pressing the same button multiple times. You know, if you're managing to press L3 twice or something like that. Does, does, do, do games do weird shit? That kind of thing. Anyway. Uh, what we haven't seen before, though, is the UI. Um, so this is how you'll actually go about doing button mapping um, and that kind of thing in the actual PlayStation 5 dashboard. Um, so again, it has any kind of uh, orientation you would like. Um, you can decide which direction is north. Um, different profiles, if more people are using it, or you have different things for different games. Um, button mapping, again. Uh, the actual software has to be told what things are doing, what things, um, whether or not you're going to use it with the DualShock, um, and then some different things around sensitivity and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that they've talked about. They go into it a lot more in this PlayStation accessibility video, although that video also talks about other things like <clears throat> the accessibility part of the PlayStation Store, um, what other accessibility options are available in different games and stuff like that. Um, there is no mention of a release date for this controller. Hopefully soon-ish, because it's pretty cool. Um, I like it as just a piece of tech. I mean, I don't have any issues with the DualShock controller myself, but it is cool to see uh, this kind of thing getting... Um, you know, actual support from an actual platform holder. Like most of the time, accessibility controllers, accessibility accessories are typically third party um, and they are also typically PC only. Um, so it would be good to see if one, uh, you know, this does well and is actually useful to the uh, community, but also can it be used outside of the PlayStation? Uh, will probably be the big decider on whether uh, whether or not it's actually all that useful for people. Anyway, moving on. Um, Mortal Kombat 1 
guys, we've gone back in time. It is 1990-something, uh, and Mortal Kombat 1 has come out, and you're trying to tell your parents that, no, it's totally fine that that guy just got his spine ripped out. Don't worry about it. No, Mortal Kombat 12, uh, previously known as, is now being uh, rebooted, and the Mortal Kombat franchise is restarting with Mortal Kombat 12, and they're going to call it Mortal Kombat 1 instead. Um, I believe this trailer is mostly CG only. Um, it's not clear who exactly is going to appear in Mortal Kombat 1. There are characters who don't actually show up until later in the series that are being shown in the trailer, so... It's not exactly going to be, like, a redo of the original Mortal Kombat, because Kitana and Melina here don't show up until Mortal Kombat 2. Kung Lao, who was shown earlier, doesn't show up till Mortal Kombat 2. Scorpion and Sub-Zero, of course, show up in the original. Uh, so that's not surprising. I don't know, there doesn't seem to be any gameplay in this trailer. <laughs> he stopped on the first one. He stopped on the first one, so it doesn't matter. Liu Kang can fly now, though, so that's something. Okay. And he has some sort of god powers? That's interesting. Versus evil Liu Kang, I guess. No, Shang Tsung. Okay, that makes more sense. Also, Shang Tsung is young, and Shang Tsung was old in the original Mortal Kombat, so it's obviously not gonna be, oh my, oh my goodness. Oh dear. Well, that's how we're demonetized already. <laughs> not that I was making any money on this, but still. Hmm. Uh, that was... That's, that's something to see on a Saturday morning. Any hour, Sunday morning. Jesus. I still think it's Saturday. And now he's saying things. Who knows? Yum, yum, yum. Delicious. Anyway, moving on. Before I get, you, you know, turned off my breakfast. Um, Lords of the Fallen uh, was given another trailer. Um, it is very much Dark Souls. You know, uh, if you were of any... Uh, if you were confused before... It's, it's Dark Souls. Anyway, uh, most of it is CG, cutscenes and what have you, so I'm just going to skip ahead until we get to the actual gameplay parts. Soon, I promise. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, Dark Souls. More or less. Uh, but you know, we could do with more Dark Souls. <laughs> Why not? More more of it. Let's go. Um, Lords of the Fallen, or THE Lords of the Fallen rather, is a a sequel slash reboot of the series that only had one game entry. Can you really call it a reboot? I don't know. Uh, the original Lords of the Fallen was also a Dark Souls-like, but wasn't particularly great. It was kind of janky and not very well balanced. This is not by the same developer, though they, are, they do have the same IP. Um, I believe the IP was bought by Embracer Group or something like that, um, so it's been given to a different developer. We'll see how it turns out. Um, I don't really know how marketing-wise it's going, so I have these trailers muted for IP and copyright reasons. Um, but the music they use in these in the last couple of trailers for the Lords of the Fallen are very like modern. You know, they're like rock music and ACDC. I think was one of the original ones for the for the original trailer and stuff like that. So it's like, where are you going with your marketing? It's a bit weird. You know, they're going all grim and dark fantasy uh, with the game, with the dialogue, with the voiceovers and stuff, and then they go, like, very modern music, which is a bit strange. Uh, but anyway, there's a uh, release date for the game as well. It's going to be out 13th of October 2023. Still quite a while off. Anyway, moving on. Um, so... Humble Games had a showcase this week. Um, most of the games weren't particularly interesting, to be honest. And I'm only kind of pointing this one out because it's a musical, which is kind of weird. Uh, I can't think of too many video games that are musicals. Music games, sure, tons of them. But games that are like a narrative story thing that's also a musical, there aren't many. Um, so I'm kind of pointing this one out because it has the writer from Dragon Age. Um, and music by Austin Wintry, he's the guy from Journey, doesn't the, uh, the music for Journey, um, and a lot of other games, but I think that's the one he's best known for. 
Uh, and the cast is also pretty incredible, voice acting cast. So there could be something pretty good here. Um, I don't, I'm not particularly a fan of the kind of low budget animations going on in that there aren't any animations. <laughs> You know, it's all still images with some very basic moving and cropping and stuff. Like, the art is great, I will give them that, but the animations are not particularly amazing, so... I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out, but, um... I don't know, I just wanted to point it out because I just found it was... It seemed kind of strange, that's all. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Xbox Game Pass is getting a, a May refresh, so some more games are coming out for it uh, in the middle of May now. So we have FIFA 23, a football game, moving on. Uh, Eastern Exodus, East, sorry, Eastern Exorcist. This is a fictitious Eastern world with an infestation of vicious demon monsters. Play as a skilled exorcist against chaotic evil to fight your way through the brutal world and experience unforeseen entanglements of complex beings. I still don't know what the game is about, but okay. Ghost Lore, with PC Game Pass, Ghost Lore is an East Punk action RPG where you fight monsters from Southeast Asian folklore, inspired by, okay, it's a Diablo Titan Quest type deal. Okay. Uh, Planet of Lana is coming out soon, it'll be uh, launching into Game Pass. Uh, Planet of Lana, the cinematic puzzle adventure, Lana, yada yada yada, it's like a uh, limbo. It's like a nice limbo, basically. Uh, cassette Beasts is kind of like Pokemon, sort of. Um, bring your cassette player and get ready to press play. Collect awesome monsters to use during turn-based battles as you adventure in the open world RPG. Cassette Beasts. Yeah, as I said, it's Pokemon. Uh, Massive Chalice, I think, is an RTS. Tactical strategy game set on an epic timeline from Double Fine Productions. Those are the guys behind Psychonauts. Uh, as the immortal ruler of the nation, you'll take command of its heroes, forge heroic marriages to strengthen your bloodlines, and battle the mysterious enemy known as the Cadence in a 300-year war. Okay. Railway Empire 2. Oh, uh, roller coaster, not roller coaster tycoon, rail tycoon. Train simulator, maybe? That kind of thing? All aboard the express train to riches and fame. Grow your company into the large... Okay, it's a management sim. Never mind. Uh, Shikari, a colorful tale, is... Actually, an excellent game. Uh, it is kind of like the older Zelda games. Uh, you play um, this dog character whose name I forget right now. This is Shikari on the left. Um, and you have this ma mystical paintbrush that can color in things in the world. The whole game is more or less black and white, and you use the paintbrush to color things in. You use it to make bridges and things you can jump on and stuff like that. Um, it's got a bit of Okami to it as well, I suppose. Um, but it is very well written, uh, it is a very heartwarming tale, um, and I would encourage you to give it a shot, so if you have Game Pass, it's out the end of the month, give it a, give it a shot, it's a really good game. Uh, and there's a bunch of DLC stuff that I'm not going to get into. Uh, so some pretty good stuff there. What is this game? The artwork looks nice, that must be Ghost Lore. No, no, that's Ghost Lore. So this must be Eastern Exorcist, I guess. Anyway. Uh, the free game on Epic uh, Game Store this week was Death Stranding, so <laughs> Epic have kind of taken my decision to only talk about the game that's coming up out of my hands because I don't know what the next game is, because it's still a mystery. You'll find out next week. I don't know if this is a change that they've made or um, Death Stranding again. Yeah, well, not everybody got it the first time, you know? It's like... You know when people say, like, on Reddit, this is a repost, or whatever, and it's like... Not everybody is on Reddit all the time, kind of thing, you know? If... If a game was only on sale once, ever, and never again, people would be pretty pissed, <laughs> you know? So... Is it annoying? Sure. It was too re- okay, uh, yeah, well, it was very recently on one of the Epic Games free games. That is fair. Um, anyway, we don't know what the next one will be, though, because they have decided to keep it a mystery. So keep an eye out, but you have up until Thursday to claim Death Stranding if you haven't already. Um, those are some of the games you can play soon, but what if you wanted to play something right now? You can play Humanity, uh, which launched this week. Humanity is not unlike a Lemmings-type game. You play a little Shiba Inu, who is responsible for um, helping humanity 
um, survive some kind of impending apocalypse. Um, so the general gist of the game is there is this stream of human beings who are trying to uh, get from point A to point B, and there are a bunch of obstacles in the way, and as the little Shiba Inu, it is your job to um, keep them safe, more or less. Uh, there's no actual gameplay in this trailer. I haven't actually watched this trailer. It seems like it might be kind of funny. Okay, there is some actual gameplay. We played a little bit of this um, when I was showcasing the PSVR 2. There was a demo for the game. We played through a couple of levels. I think it was pretty fun, pretty interesting. It is playable outside of VR. You can play it flat. Um, and it doesn't take itself too seriously, so it's a bit of a fun time thing. Okay, <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, there is also Firmament. Uh, Firmament is a VR game, uh, although I think it also has a flat version, I'm not sure. Um, only on PC for now, Firmament is from the same people who brought you Myst. Uh, so it is a heavy puzzle-based uh, video game that has nobody else in the world for some reason, probably because it's too hard to animate them. Anyway, uh, it's set in this sort of steampunk kind of uh, universe, lots of different puzzles. I don't know what the story of the game is. I'm kind of more interested in this really highly detailed VR game, um, which is what I'm looking forward to mostly. It is scheduled to launch on PlayStation at some point in the future, uh, which means it will be on PSVR 2 at some point in the future, but we don't know when, maybe some point this year. And if that is the case, we will check it out on the channel. But right now, I do not have a PC capable of doing VR. And even if I did, I don't have a VR headset for PC. So yeah, we're gonna have to wait on that one. But hopefully it'll be out soon enough and we can check it out. Anyway, unfortunately though, it is now time to talk about the worst parts of video games, the video game industry. So EU approves Microsoft's 69 nice billion dollar Activision Blizzard bid, uh, and the UK regulator slams the decision uh, because they didn't uh, agree to the bid. So I've lost my highlight. Oh no, I have my highlights. All right, so the three biggest roadblocks to the Activision Blizzard acquisition um, at the moment are the UK, the EU, and the US. Uh, the UK have blocked it. The EU, as you've just seen, have agreed. And the US is currently suing Activision. So, hmm. We'll see if it still goes through, but some, some shenanigans are going on. So what clinched it for the EU? Uh, EU has given the nod to the deal after securing agreements to lessen its potential impact on the emerging cloud gaming market, the main sticking point with the UK's regulator. So you may recall uh, the UK CMA, uh, Consumer Marketing Authority, I think, um, were against the deal because they felt it would give Microsoft way too much of a monopoly on cloud gaming in the future. Um, this includes a free license for European gamers to stream any Activision Blizzard game they own via any cloud gaming service of their choice, uh, and a free license for cloud gaming services in the region to host said games on their platform. So this basically means uh, if Activision Blizzard release a game in Europe um, and it is available for cloud streaming, it has to be available on every single cloud gaming service um, for free with no additional purchase either from the platform holder itself or from the player. Um, Microsoft, for their point, said, yeah, that's fine, and it will apply globally, like, because it will be too much of a pain in the hole to actually get it to just for each region. I'll just say, fuck it, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so, the EU seemed fine with that. The UK came back to say, this is a dumb idea, because basically you are going to need to enforce this now you're going to need to set up a regulator to make sure Microsoft are doing it. Which you're not going to do for every EU country. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Microsoft's proposals accepted by the European Commission today would allow Microsoft to set the terms and conditions for this market for the next 10 years. They would replace a free, open and competitive market with one subject to ongoing regulation of the games Microsoft sells, the platforms to which it sells them, and the conditions of sale. So basically it is you have now set up a new regulatory body but you haven't actually set anybody to do the job. Um, yeah, kinda. This, this is basically trying to accept that Microsoft will uh, keep their word. 
and do these things and not just say, yeah, we'll totally do that. Definitely. And once the deal goes through, like, <laughs> no, we're not. Fuck that. Because um, there's nothing obliging them to do so. And there won't be a body checking. You know, they'll do it for the first whatever, two, three years, what have you. How many games are going to be sold by Microsoft that are also cloud? Not many. Anyway. But yeah, that's one hurdle cleared. They're going to have to figure out how they deal with the FTC lawsuit currently going on. It's possible the merger will go through anyway. Um, and they'll just pay the fine or whatever. It's not like they don't have the money for it. The UK is kind of the more pressing issue, but I think they could probably be battered with the, the US have agreed to it and the EU have agreed to it. So like, come on, what the fuck, guys? Um, for the UK side of things, they are getting a lot of pushback from the UK government who are like, the EU agreed to it. So what's the issue? Why aren't we agreeing to it? Um, for the UK, for the CMA's part, they're like, we're not a government body. We're not controlled by the government. We're an independent authority type thing. So, you know, let us do our job. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how much pressure uh, is applied to them. It's not like the UK government are, you know, competent or anything. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Take Two says it's not seeing pushback from players on $70 game pricing. Is it blind? Anyway. Uh, Take-Two has claimed that it's not seeing consumer resistance to its games being priced at $70. This is because nobody wants to fucking buy your games. Anyway, so it's not exactly true. So this is part of a um, investor call or an earnings call that gets done every quarter or so by publicly trading companies. Uh, Strauss Zelnick, who has the most ridiculous name <laughs> for a CEO, uh... For a video game company CEO, anyway, uh, said, We're not seeing a pushback on frontline price, which is the $70 thing. Uh, what we are seeing is consumers are seeking to limit their spending by going either to the stuff they really, really care about, blockbusters, or to value, and sometimes it could be both. And the good news is we have a bunch of blockbusters and we have a wonderful catalog. So you are seeing pushback. Strauss. <laughs> I think what he's trying to say here is that he's not seeing pushback um, on their own games, I think, is it in a way to try to butter up the uh, investors and shareholders and what have you. But the fact that he can say that we are seeing consumers limit their spending to the things they either really like or to blockbusters or to value, as in sales, basically, would suggest there is, in fact, pushback on the $70 thing. Like, I can say personally... From a personal standpoint, there are a bunch of games that launched this year that ordinarily I would have gotten day one. Um, but because of their price point, I'm like, mm -hmm, okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on sale for that one. And some of them, I'm frustrated that they haven't gone on sale yet, like Dead Space. Like, it, like technically it's on sale right now, but it's not by enough. Um, but also, the Callisto Protocol turned out to be kind of shit. And... Probably glad I didn't pay full price on that. Uh, same, yeah. There's a lot of games I would have gotten, but I'm like, nope, I'm going to wait on that. Star Wars Survivor, like, yeah, I'm interested to play it, but I'm not paying that much money for it. Um, but even talking about, like, we have a wonderful catalog that people are willing to spend money on. Marvel's Midnight Suns did launch at $70 um, on PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and was discounted heavily, like, a month later. That's, that's a game that they launched, you know. So even then, he's not really telling the truth here. Especially when they're full of bugs on release. Yeah, that's not great either, really. Like, having, you know, games be updatable, and like patched and so on, is a good thing overall. Like, it does give us, like, additional content and stuff like that. But at the same time, companies have gotten very comfortable pushing out buggy games. Too comfortable, one, one might say. Anyway, um, continuing on, uh, Strauss says, There has been some pressure as a result if a consumer sees something that's interesting but not necessarily yet a huge blockbuster. So this is like, hey, that game looks kind of interesting. I'd like to play it. $70, fuck that. Like, how is that not pushback? Like, I, I don't get We're not seeing pushback on a frontline price. You clearly are. You clearly are, anyway. 
Um, as pointed out, though, by the article's author, whose name is Tom, Tom Ivan, points out that 2K was actually the first company to do $70 for a game. So you can blame them. <laughs> they started it. They started it with NBA 2K21, uh, was announced as the first current-gen game to be priced at $70. Sony and Activision followed shortly after, and then EA and Square Enix followed uh, soon after with them. Um, it was only this year, I think, um, that Microsoft and Nintendo released their first $70 game. So Tears of the Kingdom is a $70 game. And I don't know what Microsoft's one is. What's the latest? Redfall, maybe? Was Redfall 70 bucks? <laughs> Wow, now that's a bad one. Ubisoft are yet to do it, and apparently Skull and Bones will be their first $70 title, so they're never going to release a $70 title. Okay, all right, cool. Good for that. <laughs> that game's never fucking coming out. Anyway, moving on. Uh, report. Sony fails to appeal Austrian loot box verdict. So, um, this is a class action suit that was taken in Austria by a bunch of FIFA players, uh, specifically PlayStation FIFA players, who said that um, the ability to resell foot coins and that kind of thing on a secondary market meant it was effectively gambling. Um, Sony had some time to appeal it, but didn't. And since they didn't appeal it, the default is not in their favor, so they are now on the hook to pay a lot of money. Uh, Austrian's court's ruling that the FIFA Ultimate Team packs constitute illegal gambling has gone unchallenged. A dispute from PlayStation FIFA players and Sony Interactive Entertainment Europe. Um, the ability to sell player cards on a secondary market qualifies them as illegal gambling. Sony had the, had the chance to appeal it, but at this time had not received any such, or sorry, the court had not received any such motion. Uh, and so the ruling became final last month. Sony is now on the hook to refund several hundred euros to the plaintiffs. Um, and perhaps worse news, for Sony and possibly Microsoft and possibly Steam and so on, Valve. Uh, hundreds of other players are interested in now pursuing similar claims. Um, Padronus, who is the legal, the, the law firm who uh, was representing the plaintiffs in this case, have specified that FIFA, Counter-Strike, Fortnite, Call of Duty and a bunch of other games are all uh, similarly in the same situation. So there's been a potential floodgate for class action suits here. Um, for these games constituting illegal gambling. Um, this also follows on from the suggestion that I think... I know the Netherlands did it. Maybe Austria did it as well. Netherlands court fined EA 10 million euro after deciding that Ultimate Team violated gambling laws. So yeah, it's kind of a, the idea that these countries that were... Um, have decided that loot boxes are gambling and are illegal, unregulated gambling... Um, if you're, if you're still trying to sell this shit, you're, you're gonna get sued. Uh, and you don't really have any grounds. Uh, the question then is, do they just eat the cost? Like, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money to billion dollar companies, you know? It's like, oh, uh, here you go. Like, do they care? That's the thing. It's like, if a fine can be easily paid, then it's just the cost of doing business, really. Anyway, okay, so continuing on on the loot box mi mini transaction micro buys thing. Uh, only now, seven months in, can free Overwatch 2 fans afford a legendary skin. So seven months of constant gameplay, you can finally buy a skin in Overwatch 2, a legendary skin specifically. Uh, the shooter is notoriously stingy with currency and so on. So. Uh, the hypothetical player who has just been earning credits by playing can finally afford one of the game's top skins, and only one. Seven months since the sequel launched in October. So yeah, you can totally earn things in-game, you don't have to spend any money ever on cosmetics. You can all earn them all in-game. Mm -hmm. Seven fucking months to get it. Uh, the way to do it, the weekly challenges grant you a paltry 60 coins and a legendary skin costs a whopping 1,900 of those. So you do the maths, it's about 32 weeks to get it done. Uh, only if you have dilig yeah, diligently completed your challenges every single week and have bought absolutely zero cosmetics with the coins you've earned until this point could you now afford a legendary skin. So it is very much trying to force you to spend actual money because we're going to be incredibly stingy 
otherwise. That's kind of shitty. Um, on top of this, there is other news coming out about Overwatch 2 in that the PvE mode, the story mode, uh, or the hero quests and so on, that were a huge um, selling point for Overwatch 2 in the first place. So you may or may not recall the Overwatch, Overwatch 2 discourse uh, when it was coming out. The idea was, why isn't this just an update to Overwatch? Why is this a sequel? Why do we have to like, buy the game again and so on? Um, why do we have to transfer to a different thing? Why do we have to start over on our, all our profiles and what have you? And they're like, we want to be able to do all these extra story things and, you know, have these cool PvE uh, options and stuff like that that we just can't do with the current Overwatch engine. Like, it would require such a massive overhaul that we might as well just do a sequel. Um, there was some people push back on it because, hey, I don't play Overwatch for the story. I only play it for the PvP, so I don't care. Or, and so on. But eventually, as Activision Blizzard is wont to do, they forced it through and Overwatch 2 came out. Um, it did not launch with the PvE stuff. Uh, it only launched with PvP. Um, and they say that PvE is coming later. Uh, we're working on it. It's going to be super cool when it comes out. Can't wait to show you guys. Um, this week they said, lol, that's not happening anymore. It's too much work and we don't have enough people to work on it, so... I don't know, but you're locked into Overwatch 2 now, so keep spending money. Um, basically, the loss of PvE and the incredible stinginess of Overwatch 2. Overwatch 1 wasn't this stingy. Overwatch 2 is incredibly stingy. Um, has kind of led to the idea of what was the point of Overwatch 2. And I think you guys know now. You know what it was. We wanna, we wanna, more, we want money. Give me more. Daddy needs to buy a new elephant or something. Anyway. CD Projekt lays off 29 staff at the Molasses Flood. Um, so, this is coming on top of news from a couple of months ago that CD Projekt had had to restart development on whatever game the Molasses Flood are working on. Some kind of Witcher spin-off thing called Project Sirius. Um, they had spent a couple of million on development up until then and I guess we're not happy with where it was going and they said you know what let's just let's just start again um, and the part of starting again is we need to cut like half the workforce okay that's a bit much but all right um, because the project has changed so has the composition of the team that's working on it mainly on the molasses flood side uh, not on the CG project red side on the company they acquired Mm-hmm. The concrete number of employees we parted way we parted ways with. Fuck you. Anyway, we parted ways with is 21 team members in the US and 8 in Poland. Um and according to Marie Delessandri from Games Industry, this constitutes half of Molasses Flood. So half of the company has been let go. Um This is after CJ Project Red acquired the studio uh two years ago in October. For an undisclosed sum, they don't need to disclose it because they're not publicly trading. Um, and they then announced a bunch of new Witcher projects, uh, one of them being Project Sirius for the Molasses Flood. Um, I bet they're regretting that acquisition now. But even so, that's kind of a shitty, you know, poorly managed project, spending 7 million euro only to go, yeah, this isn't what we want, let's start again. And let's get rid of half of the company while we're at it. That's a pretty expensive layoff right there. Anyway. 12 months after launch, Battle Royale Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt is ending development. So yet another live service has died. We'll talk about this in a minute. But let's just talk about this one for now. Uh, so 12 months after its launch, development is ending. Shark Mob blaming the title's failure to reach the critical mass needed to continue support. I.e. you weren't spending enough money. We weren't getting enough whales in, basically. Uh, so the Battle Royale, um, with vampires with guns for some fucking reason, uh, was okay, but never really attracted a, a, a huge player base. Okay, so while the game had an amazing and very engaged community, we haven't been able to reach the critical mass needed to sustain development, i.e. we don't have enough big spenders coming in and spending money on the game. It's a free-to-play game. Um, 
It has led us to the decision to stop for the development of Blood Hunt. Um, although rather nicely, and most games don't do this, so this is nice from Shark Mob. Servers will remain live for as long as we have an active player base and community. So that is good. That the servers will stay up. People who like do actually enjoy playing the game can still play it. Um, most of the time when these live services die, that's it. There's no attempt to preserve the game or anything like that. Um, the whole for as long as we have an active player base thing is not great. Like that does mean there is a like a deadline. Like people will eventually stop playing it, either because they get bored or because they just die. <laughs> they can't play it anymore. Either or. Um, but it is highlighting yet another live service that has died. Um, this is somewhat concerning. Um, so Sony are giving a uh, PlayStation Showcase thing next week, Wednesday. Um, and in the news and in rumors, and not even rumors, I think they have outright said that they are working on 10, at least, live service games. And there have been a whole bunch of them closed and stopped and shut down production, shut down development and so on in the last couple of months. And Sony are like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to jump on this dying bandwagon that all the wheels are coming off and the horse has left thing. Yep, they're going to put all our money into that. That's a little... Uh, hmm, that doesn't sound good. Uh, feel like maybe you should make other games that aren't just blockbusters and live services. Maybe... Maybe some indies. Maybe, maybe resurrect Japan Studio. Maybe make you know any of those kind of games. No, 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 no. We don't want to do that. All right. Anyway, moving on. All right. One last thing. Nicolas Cage is going to be in Dead by Daylight. Okay. Fair enough. Why not? Um, so this was part of a Dead by Daylight um, update showcase video thing that came out later or earlier this week. Uh, where they were showing off some of the updates that are coming to the game and some new games. Uh, I think they're they're partnering with Supermassive Games, the people behind Until Dawn, the Dark Pictures, and so on, in a Dead by Daylight game uh, that is going to be a similar choose-your-own-adventure type thing that they're known for, but based on the Dead by Daylight universe. Um, but anyway, going back to Nicolas Cage, literally Nicolas Cage is going to be a Dead by Daylight. He's not playing a character or anything. He is... Nicolas Cage in the game. Uh, he's not a killer though, unfortunately. That would have been funny, but no. He's gonna be playing a survivor. He was working on a, a film set and he, act he acted so good, he summoned an otherworldly entity and got pulled into the Dead by Daylight game. After countless awards and over 100 movies shot across the globe, Nicolas Cage has seen it all and done it all, or so he thought. While on set, filming the role of a lifetime, his performance summoned the entity, a malevolent being of incomprehensible power. The actor soon found himself cast in otherworldly fog, forced to survive a host of terrifying killers, deadlier than even the most scathing film critic. Yeah, he acted himself into a horror situation. I mean, if anybody could do it, it's Nicolas Cage, but still. That's pretty, that's pretty fucking dumb. Um, learn more on July 5th, so... Yeah, there'll be an update next, no, not next month, the month after next month, July, uh, where you'll know all about Nicolas Cage and his skill tree in Dead by Daylight. I'm curious what it's going to be. If he doesn't have a face-off one, where he can, like, pretend to be another survivor or something, I don't know how that will work. I just hope they kind of, like, put some of his movies into the skill tree, like he has a Ghost Rider moment or something. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in real life. I mean, he could do it, right? If anybody is going to summon Cthulhu with his acting, it's going to be Nicolas Cage. Um, I don't know. It'll be funny to see if they put in, like... I want to see a face-off one, because that's the film I know like, I know him best from. I watched it a lot. It's very dumb, but I love it. Um, but it'd be funny to see if, if they put any other stuff uh, that he's been in into those games. Anyway, that is... Uh, the news, I'll leave, no, I'll leave humanity to play. Anyway, that is the news for the 15th uh, to the 21st of May, 2023. So, Sony have given a name to their Project Leonardo controller. It's the Access controller. We don't know when it's coming out, but it looks pretty cool. Um, Lords of the Fallen has a trailer. Its marketing is a bit, I don't know what's going on, but it very much looks like Dark Souls. Um, 
Humble Games had a showcase. I showed off one of their games that looked interesting. It's kind of a musical thing where it's like a modern uh, Greek gods in the real world. Think like The Wolf Among Us, but instead of fable characters, it's Greek gods. Um, humanity is out today, or not today, this week. It's fun. You're, you play a dog, you do dog things. Um, industry bullshit. EU has approved the activist. <laughs> Microsoft Activision acquisition, um, so that just leaves them to try to get over the UK roadblock and figure out what they're going to do with the FTC lawsuit. Um, Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt has shut down, it's yet another live service that has shut down. Um, and Nicholas Nicolas Cage is going to be in Dead by Daylight. I might actually have to play Dead by Daylight now. Not going to happen. I'm just going to have to watch somebody play it a lot, I guess. Anyway, that is the news, but what is happening um, on the channel next week? So, if I can find our spot. So, again, this is our roadmap for the first six months of 2023. Um, so, reminders about these things. Um, green symbol means the game has been featured. Yellow symbol, the game is currently being featured. Uh, the grey symbol, the game is on its way soon at some point, and the yellow gold wedge in the top left corner means it's it will be a full let's play. Um, and if there's no symbol on it whatsoever, look, look, uh, the game is either not out yet or I'm getting to it. Give me a minute. You know, I'm waiting for it to go on sale, possibly. Anyway, um, so this week we played, um, we started a couple of new LPs, which we'll talk about in a second, and then we also played, uh, Strayed Lights on Friday as part of Foley Plays Games A Bit, where we play newly released games for a bit. Um, so Strayed Lights, uh, so Strayed Lights is a, um, brawler game where you toggle between two different colors, so you're trying to color match with your opponent. If you can color match with your opponent and block at the same time, uh, you will build up power meter. And when you build up full power meter, you can end the fight kind of thing. So it's mostly uh, survive long enough, color match with your opponent, and also parry them at the same time kind of thing. So it's got a bit of a rhythm uh, thing to it. Um, the game also has no spoken dialogue whatsoever. Um, so it's very much up to you to sort of intuit what's going on just from animations and how people behave, how the creatures behave and so on and so forth. Um, it's okay. There were certain aspects of it I liked, like the rhythm combat stuff. I was finding it a little tricky to get the rhythm at the beginning. Um, but I think about halfway through it, it was starting to click with me, but... The environments are all kind of samey, like you are going to different biomes and tackling different bosses and stuff like that, but they all feel... The environments at least all feel kind of the same. The bosses are at the very least unique. Um, they have their own different attacks, their own different patterns and stuff like that, but the gameplay is kind of samey. Like once you've fought the first boss, you kind of know what's involved from then on. You never really get any new abilities and stuff like that. I don't know, basically, is, is is what I'm saying. Anyway, moving on, because YouTube has moved me on. Um, next week, we'll be continuing one of the Let's Plays that we started. So we started the original Bioshock on Tuesday. We'll be continuing that this Tuesday. And we have reached Fontaine Fisheries. So if you're familiar with the game, you'll know that's still kind of early in the game. Um, as we bumbled about in uh, Bioshock fighting big daddies and um, looking for Adam and so on. Um, anyway, we'll be continuing that on, uh, Tuesday. On Wednesday, we started Cloudpunk. Uh, so Cloudpunk, you play Rania, you are newly to this, uh, cyberpunk dystopia, uh, Nivalis. It is your first day working for the courier service Cloudpunk that is, uh, possibly a front for some illegal trafficking, trading stuff going on. It's not clear. Um, you are just trying to get through your first night uh, as a courier, um, and you're you know you're meeting people in the city. There's some overarching plot lines being developed. Uh, there's maybe some strangeness going on in Cloudpunk, the company itself. Um, we are kind of just getting 
acquainted with the world right now, um, and the story is kind of meandering a little right now, but I, you know, plot threads will come together probably in the next stream. Uh, and also it looks quite pretty, so it's got that going for it. Um, Nine Years of Shadows, we didn't play it this week. Um, I had intended to do so, but I was just too fucking tired on Thursday, so I didn't get around to it. Uh, so we'll be back to it uh, this Thursday, uh, getting incredibly angry at various boss fights, I imagine. Nine Years of Shadows is a colorful Metroidvania type game that has a whole lot of bosses. It might as well be a boss rush game, honestly, it's so many. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's, if the game just has so many bosses or I just don't remember if Castlevania had this many bosses. Maybe it did. Anyway, it seems like a lot. We'll be back to it uh, on uh, Friday. Not Friday, Thursday. Um, this Friday there won't be a stream, but on Saturday we'll be continuing the quarry uh, with Melwen. Um, things are starting to get interesting in the story. We're, you know, some things have been explained and some additional mysteries have been thrown up. Uh, we may or may not have killed some people in the last stream. It may or may not have been on purpose. Um, but we'll find out, possibly, uh, we'll possibly finish the game next stream. Um, so drop by either my channel or Melvin's channel for those shenanigans, uh, and we'll see what happens. And that is the plan for next week. Totally, it was totally on purpose. Okay, yeah, it, w it was. It was on purpose. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that will be the plan uh, for next week then. So Tuesday, Bioshock. Uh, it's technically it's Bioshock Remastered. Uh, Wednesday, Cloudpunk. Uh, Thursday, Nine Years of Shadows. No stream on Friday because my company is doing a meetup thing that I have to go to. Uh, and The Quarry with Melwin on Saturday. And then we'll be right back around Sunday uh, to the weekly news recap. Right. So that is your news and your channel update for the 15th of May, uh, 2000, sorry, 15th of May to the 21st of May, 2023. Um, yeah, next week on the channel looks a lot like last week on the channel. Um, I have been thinking of varying things up or doing Let's Plays on off weeks just to keep things interesting for myself. Um, also been thinking of doing one long game, you know, just a game that will take me months to finish just like something to build up I don't know something that people can be like hey Foley's streaming it's probably this you know instead of I wonder what he's streaming now because I change the game almost every week kind of thing so I don't know I'm still thinking about it uh, I also need to change these banners because these images are wrong or over my head I don't know where they are I can't see OBS right now um I don't know the channel is still in flux, largely. Anyway, I'm gonna head off. No worries, Melwan. Thanks for dropping by. Um, Melwan will be streaming Mafia later, possibly, maybe. Keep an eye out. Uh, she might be streaming Mafia later. Otherwise, um, I will see you guys on Tuesday for uh, Bioshock. Right. Have a good one. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you.